Hollywood film that was going to have the biggest press junket ever in Hollywood, and the film was Close Encounters of the Third Kind. And that got me started, and uh, knock on some wood, I've managed to make a living for the last um, 32 years. <laughs> and, and, um, you know, Henry, I was reading your bio, and you know, I was talking about the fact that you were, you know, participating in gang activity, and are from East L.A., um, and you've actually taken some of that experience and brought it with you. Yeah, I have a very uh, unique situation. Um, my family is four generations in gangs, and I was, when I talk to kids, I always say my grandma has tattoos, so I'm however tough you think you are. <laughs> <laughs> So I was literally just afraid of my family because when I was growing up, uh, my cousins were in gangs and they were getting shot or they were actually killing people. And I was like 15 years old and I just wasn't a bad kid. I just kept, just kept staying in school, but I wasn't really necessarily a good student. I just like, you know, chasing girls and whatever you do when you're just not focused in school hanging out. But then I was recruited to join the wrestling team. And uh, wrestling changed my life because it, it, it introduced me to college and it introduced me to film. I'm wrestling in college, in, in high school, and my best friends uh, were on track to go to college. And I was just going to stay back. I was cooking burgers, and I just figured, well, my cousins are in jail or, or in prison and, uh, or dead. And uh, as long as I don't like, get shot and do the things that they do, you know, cooking burgers isn't so bad because I'm alive and I'm safe. But then my, co my college coach, my high school coach, she gave me like a $300 scholarship and said, hey, we want to college up the street has a wrestling team. So um, I went to wrestle. And uh, then the wrestling coach said, hey, Disney's making a movie about his wrestling team. Why don't you guys go audition? So he sends a whole team to audition <laughs> on this Disney movie. <laughs> and I actually booked one of the major roles in the movie, just by fluke, just by accident. Zero acting experience, zero care, but I got paid to wrestle. So, okay, here I am wrestling, I'm in, I'm in this Disney movie, and um, next thing you know, you know, the movie came and went, I made a lot of money, moved from Newport, uh, to East LA to Newport Beach for a couple of years, um, surf, and then kind of like morphed into like, you know, something else. And that, I, I didn't know that I was going to either finish school, I didn't know what I was doing, but I just had a conversation with my coach, my coach was like, look, if you don't want to go to school, just keep going until you find a good job. Well, I never found a really good job without an education, so I stuck it out and I ended up um, getting my associate's degree and transferring to Whittier because uh, I knew at that point I didn't really focus on my education, but I knew that I needed to get my butt kicked. Um, and I, I, I totally just gave myself to Whittier and said, okay, if I drop out of here, then I'm in trouble because I'm going to owe a lot of money. <laughs> so uh, I focused, and while I was coming here, I got a call from a, an agent and he says, hey, uh, you're the guy that did that Disney movie and Nike wants to speak to you. So I'm like, all right. So I went to this audition and Nike says, oh, you're too small. Well, at the end of the audition, I convinced them to come to my old high school and I produced the scene for them because they didn't know anything about the sport. And then I said, since I'm too small, I, I suggest you guys hire a small referee. <laughs> <laughs> I was here, and then I was still in college, and then uh, uh, Adidas called, hey, you did that Nike thing, so, and I was a, a consultant for Adidas on the wrestling commercial. And, um, yeah, I just still thought it was like something that was just going to be like, you know, quick, literally like quit bugging me, it's cool, but like, wow, I don't know what's going on here. So I eventually became a teacher, and um, my identity while I was here is I totally thought I was going to be a teacher and uh, save the world, you know, um, through teaching. So I became a teacher and I got a job at South Money High School and I eventually taught at Rio Honda Community College. But while I was teaching, my friends were in film school and since I did Disney, Nike, and Adidas, they would put me in their short films because I didn't realize I was saving them money because I was a SAG actor and I could have charged them 800 bucks a day, but they were getting me for free. Um, so long story short, I ended up... I get jokes Right? So long story short, I, um, I just kept the foot in the industry and took some acting classes and just was, it was for fun. Then I got laid off 
um, from teaching. I got laid off from Rio Honda College and from East LA College, uh, from uh, South Monte High School. I was teaching programs for at-risk kids because I was an at-risk kid. So I specialized in that. But you know, when, when your programs are funded by grants and the grants run out, it's like, sorry guy, you know, have a good life, you know? So here I was without a, without a job and looking for another job. And my friends just said, Henry, <clears throat> we're filmmakers and you're the guy that has Nike, Adidas, Adidas and Disney's on your resume. Maybe you have something there. And I literally just threw my hands in the air and said, okay, I don't know if I'm gonna write, direct or produce but I'm gonna just take that maybe God wants me to explore this and I'm gonna respect that. You know, and, and that's all I did. I just, so I just went to Hollywood and I jumped on everybody's project and started asking, what does that light do? What does this do? What does that do? Come to find out, um, I, I, I realized that I'm a, a producer because when you teach, you're producing by the minute in class. And when I go to Hollywood, I'm asking all these questions and I'm showing up on time and I'm working late and I'm organizing things, but it, it just helped me move up the ladder so quick. And people would say like, hey Henry, what did you do for this project? Uh, I worked for free for a lot of people for many years, but I gained a lot of experience. So in, in kind of short, that's kind of how it happened. I didn't mean for it to happen, but it's a, it's a great story, you know? Right. And, <clears throat> and Joseph, you have a very uh, prestigious background in, in uh, human, human resources law, right? So. How did you end up in the, with doing some of your business in the entertainment industry? Well, I'm trying to think about how you follow up a uh, Emmy Award winning director <laughs> and a uh, groundbreaking marketing executive and, a, and an actor with a grandmother with tattoos. <laughs> <laughs> well, I certainly have the least inspiring story of anybody up here on the table because not only did I never expect to be in the entertainment industry, I'm really still not in the entertainment industry. Uh, I think, you know, one of the things that, and maybe the reason I'm up here is that uh, I have a little different perspective because I'm really sort of a, a service provider, really, and, and, you know, lawyers don't like to be called service providers, but we really are, in this case, a service provider to the entertainment industry, and uh, what I do is I work with NBC Television on all their um, television shows, which can be anything from just sort of day-to-day -day advice on employment law issues to training. I was up at uh, the Burbank studio today doing training for a couple of the shows up there, Last Call and uh, Access Hollywood. Uh, as you might imagine, there's kind of a hot topic right now out there about workplace romance. You might have heard about some things that have been occurring at a different network, however, not, not my network, uh, that has led for us to have some discussions with people, especially talent, about some of the issues to be careful about in that arena. Uh, so, you know, those things like that will come up. Uh, it was for me, it was really sort of a happenstance luck thing. We actually, for me, it broke in. I had somebody who got sick, and I was at the law firm, and they called, and they said, we need somebody to fill in on this television show. And I went up and worked with them. It was a brand new television show. They had a lot of questions about employment law issues. I was able to give answers to them. They liked the answers. The show was called The Office. And, uh, <laughs> I got a good break. And so, you know, they called me back and had me work on some other television shows, and now I'm pretty much there guy that exclusively works with the television shows on that range. But that's not all I do. I mean, I represent, you know, big companies like Honeywell and small companies, and uh, they're not just in the entertainment industry. So, you know, NBC is just one of my clients, uh, but I do employment law for a lot of different clients, and, 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 and the entertainment industry is an interesting one to work for with some unique challenges that, you know, we'll probably get into as we go along. Um, I actually really like this next question, um, and uh, it's term show business entered the lexicon, there have been pervasive understandings that in many ways the industry is an eternally yet balanced struggle between creative and operating uh, forces. Um, can you comment on the intersection between show and business and how, it, how they influence each other? And how does one potentially interfere with the other? It's like a marriage. Sometimes an uncomfortable marriage. Yes. <laughs> you, the, the struggle is you're trying to create art, but you need to create art that makes money, um, or that at least breaks even. And the, it's, a, it's a constant struggle. It's a constant struggle between compromising or not compromising, between having a vision. As a filmmaker, you start out, you start out with a dream. Every film 
there's somebody who's got a checkbook, that your dream is also a potentially profitable one. That's the constant struggle. The struggle is to marry, marry your dream, your concept, your work of art, to a package that looks like it has the potential to make money. The struggle is, is with you every day. And then you hope that you have brilliant executives working for the distributor of your film who can create advertising campaigns that make people want to see your film. Did I say something to offend those ladies? <laughs> uh, maybe their own was offended. <laughs> anyway, um, you hope you're working with brilliant creative executives who understand your vision, who understand your passion, who understand your dream, and know how to sell it. I think that the weak link in the film industry these days, in the independent film industry, which is where I come from, is in distribution, is in getting the product. It's not in them. There are, there are talented filmmakers who, are, who have films that deserve to be made and are making films that deserve to be seen. The problem is getting them to the public, and that's the weak link in the business. If the business is lacking anything right now, it's creative distribution. It is. I mean, right now we are in a very strange space because I know all of you hear about, read about uh, independent filmmaking. It's like the hip thing of the last, I don't know, eight, ten years. Um, for a few years, I was a adjunct professor at USC teaching marketing to grad students. And it just amazed me how many of the students wanted to be in the film business, wanted to be a producer, but did not really grasp the idea that they were in mass entertainment and that there was a need for their stories to be rich and full and something that would draw an audience. So every year on the blackboard, whiteboard, whatever board, um, I would write, who are you making your movie for? And it was quite amazing how many of them actually had no idea, or they had this wonderful idea, and it really was a half a million dollar home movie. And I said, I just found that to be quite odd. And I and I said to many of them, you'll appreciate this, if you don't know what your movie is and who you're going to sell it to, then you're going to leave it up to people like me, and then you're going to be unhappy. <laughs> because we're going to look for the, the little gem that's going to sell the most, might not be anything like you thought you were making. And it's just going to be the bad marriage, um, which there are quite a few of. So I would always encourage these would-be producers to make sure that they thought through their concepts, their ideas, and to make sure that they were actually making something for an audience. Now that doesn't mean you need to cheapen it. I don't believe, I, I'm, I'm horrified with um, the film business in some ways right now because we have really gone to dumb and dumb. Um, the easy way out, um, the studios have turned into something else now. The studio, the studios don't, don't make films for adults. No. Studios only make films for children. And they only make comic strips. Yes, They're and now with all the electronic, and it's, it's really a shame. Uh, because the baby boomer group um, is still avid film goers. And uh, it is just a huge, huge mistake. I, I think we're in a, in a funny space. Uh, I think we'll get out of it. I'm not quite sure how. And certainly um, in distribution, there is there are huge issues. I've spent most of my career in the studio system, but the last uh, six or seven in independent. And it is unbelievably frustrating to get the films up on the screen and getting worse each year. And we've lost what's happened because of the studio systems, because of the focus on comic books, mm -hmm. on technology rather than human beings. We've lost the art of storytelling. Oh, so Directors much. have lost the art of telling a story. It's about technology, it's about gimmicks, it's about stunts of varying degrees. It's not about people and what happens to them. And that is the great lack in the American film industry now. And it's a, it's a bad time. It's a bad time for directors. It's a bad time for writers. And the
struggle for sometimes eight, nine, ten years or longer to get a film made, and we get it made, we have a great deal of difficulty getting it into a theater, getting it to people. It's a very difficult, frustrating time, but not a time to give up, a time just to find new ways to solve yes, the problem. Yes, kind of let me chime in a bit. What I like about you said is trying to develop a project eight, nine, ten years, and as you're developing your project, eight, nine, ten years, you see Spider-Man one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And you're like, that's the frustrating part. Where your story, the, all the time you're developing it, they're just doing the remake, the this, the that, the same storyline. That's the frustrating part. Rocky is my favorite movie, but, but because it has that independent feel to it. Rocky two, three, four were great. I love Rocky, but do we need ten of them? No, we don't. You know? um, as an independent filmmaker, I'm a, a, a director of a film festival, and so we showcase uh, so many, we showcase 200 films uh, a year at the festival. And um, there are filmmakers out there that are doing some great work, but it's just a shame because even the markets at the film festival have seen a decline in the films that are even purchased at the film festival. Like Sundance last year was its lowest uh, in respect to the sales that were uh, were closed at the festival, it was its lowest that it's had in many years and stuff. So the the studio system really shook us up a lot because they're deciding to do, you know, films that fit the template um, of the films that are making money, you know, and they don't want to steer away from that from that template. I was at a party with somebody from Lionsgate the other day and we're talking and he just simply put his hand on my shoulder and says, We're probably gonna do Saw twenty. <laughs> He just told me that. He's like, whatever you're doing, if it doesn't look like Saul. What yeah. happened is that the, the studios, when founded, were founded by people who had a passion for making movies. They may have been bastards, they may have been true businessmen, but Selznick, Goldwyn, Warner were people who had passion for making movies. The studios now are run by executives who, by and large, could have been running parking lots. They have no passion for a film. They have no passion for the story. And therefore, I tell my younger colleagues, when you go to pitch an idea to a studio or to a network, you think you're talking about your film, the film you care deeply about. What the gentleman or the lady on the other side of the desk is talking about is keeping their job. And the safest way to keep your job is not to stick your neck out, to say no. It's safer to say no. And if you're not listening to something that you've heard a dozen times before, the safest thing is to say no to it. If you're listening to Saw 20, and oh, hey, yeah, we do that at the right price, that's got to make money, because all the Saw 1 through 19 make money, so that's a safe bet. And if it doesn't make money, nobody can point their finger at me and say I made the wrong decision. I made the safe decision. But if you're coming in with the, uh, with the modern retelling of the Oedipus story,
for negotiation with the guilds and pirating of the materials. Um, residual rights for electronic sell-through was a big, you know, sticking point with the last year of negotiation. <coughs>
Facebook, I have, what, about 1,500 friends. And um, since I'm an independent filmmaker and I do a film festival, I actually have a following. It's not like they're just my friends. When I put something up, if you're an actor or a producer and I say I'm going to be at an event, I get some people because it's a networking thing also. But um, that show had so much viral marketing just within the Latino community because we support one another. Um, it, it's just great that we have these outlets that, um, you know, CNN, they do their own marketing, but if you believe in something and you're passionate about it, you can also be a little marketing tool for that particular project as well. I think the internet so, is sort of an untamed giant. I mean, yeah, it is. It's huge. We don't understand it yet. We don't understand how to control it. We're just beginning to find out how to use it. But it's, it's still a, a monster that has not been brought under uh, any sort of rule of law. But whatever the rule of law is that finally applies to it has got to provide a way for the creators yeah. to, to make a living based on what they create. Another example that I, wanted to, I would like to talk about too is that um, sometimes people don't realize that the industry, the entertainment industry also affects the community in, everywhere. For example, uh, when, when the unions go on strike in our industry, they partner with other unions in other industries. So if my mother works at the bakery, which she, that's what she does, and they go on strike, be, or they're going to support the Screen Actors Guild, she's knowledgeable. She's calling me like, hey, I, I just heard this, you know, this is going on. Can you inform me a little bit? Sometimes what it does is it, um, it, it allows that discussion, you know, it, it's that uh, starting point of discussion for maybe some union members or maybe are not as active, but because now it's reaching in, into people's homes, the parents, the brothers, the sisters become interested in that topic and create dialogue. You know, so it's 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 not like before. We're just waiting for the newspaper to come out, you know, and just for TV. We have other mediums now that that are informing everybody. So, in some ways, that viral marketing it, it's it's beneficial. You know? Okay, there was actually um, uh, an interesting um, conversation that you were just having because um, I know that at Sony, one of the things that we're always trying to do is to figure out a way to monetize, you know, we know that people will go and watch things online, but how do you monetize that so that you can actually share those profits with the um, participants, right? Um, I mean, Sony really is interested in sharing. <laughs> really? I, you know what? Okay. Oh, come on. Truly. Wow. <laughs> Bottom of my heart. Okay. Um, I'll actually, expect my check. <laughs> actually, actually, and I know I'm just the moderator, I'm just the moderator. <laughs>
I never would have gotten my 15 cents. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you have to stop and think how many 15 cents have I not gotten. But the, the very task of keeping track of all that is really huge. And, uh, and, and I don't, you know, I commend you. And it's a, it's a, but it's a job that we all depend on. We all depend on the honesty of the companies who own the product. And the and the, the the truth on the part of the people who are administering those mm -hmm. those companies and reporting those payments and making the payments. Definitely. Well, and we're constantly audited. You know, constantly uh, self auditing as well as external you know audits, which you know it's it's um, a very important part of the industry. So anyway, that's my two cents. <laughs> Literally, two cents. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to make one comment about um, talking about getting the box office figures out on Monday. <laughs> when I was at Paramount Pictures, and I don't really remember which year or which movie, um, but the vice chairman of the studio came to my office and said, we're going to start giving numbers on Sunday. <laughs> and I looked at him and I thought, really, we're going to give numbers for the weekend before the weekend <laughs> even over. Which I personally thought was a horrible idea, but um, they did it. Uh, mostly based on mathematics and, um, and figuring out if it made this much that, you know, the whole number, a bunch of folks somewhere were sitting there tabulating it out. And uh, I, I still, to this day, think it's the most bizarre thing in the world that you know how a movie performed on a Sunday afternoon and Sunday
think that it does create an opportunity for, um, for us to, to, to grow as an industry and as creatives to find a new way. I have a model that I haven't introduced yet that's gonna, um, that I'm developing to present to a studio, wait, wait, um, that will help make you a million. To make us millions of dollars. But that will make it more an event of an event to go to a movies aside from just going to buy popcorn and spend 50 bucks at the snack stop, the snack stand, you know. Um, I think that going to a movie, uh, when they used to do a lot of short films, you know, if you get more, if, if they get more for their buck and create, I think that there's an opportunity now to start rethinking that experience in the movie theater. Well, so it's a night on the town where maybe you're not, you don't have to spend so much money, things like that. But I, I still believe that people care about stories about other people. That if you can reach people's emotions, make them care, if you can expand the human heart by the story you tell, that there will be an audience for your story. And that's the, the belief that uh, gets me up into the office every day, and as often as possible to the set. Um, that if you, if you can reach people, if you can reach their deepest emotions, loves their fears, their concerns, and tell them a story that matters, that they will be there to listen to your story. And that's what has to be the, the goal, the prize in front of us. Regardless of the technology, regardless of the economics, we tell stories. And that's our job, and that's what, that's what got us to where we are and to what we do. And as long as we hold that goal in front of us, then we will succeed. Can I ask you, what was your favorite project that you worked on? Mine? Yeah. Oh, that's a tough question. It's always the next one. Um, <laughs>
by the name of Jesse Garcia. He was in the movie Quinceanera that won Sundance in 2006. He's a friend of mine. I actually cast him uh, in his first lead for a film for Lionsgate. And, and, and this, we, we were friends before then. But he calls me one day and said, Henry, um, I'm going to do this film. And uh, it's my first time producing. It's a short film. But we have an investor that wants to put $10 million into this feature film. But the director is a first time director. And he wants him to prove himself. So. That's on his name. Right. So, Not the first time director, but got the ten million. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a, the story is really it's cool. It's an amazing story. So he's calling me. Jesse says, "Look, it's my first time uh, producing, and I've never done this before. And since you're like the first legitimate Latino independent producer that I met, when you do this with me, I happen to be busy at the time, so I decline." And then he calls me like two months before they start shooting. He's like, "Look, I'm not taking no for an answer. Figure it out." So um, I'm like, okay, you know, we were shooting in like five different states, and we did it. We made it happen. It was amazing. It turned out to be like a 30-minute short film shot on 16 millimeter. I just thought I was doing some guys a favor. Turns out I, I, we get a call. It's like, hey, we submitted to Cannes Film Festival. Uh, it was a 9/11 tribute film, so it was very political, uh, and it was basically to support the troops. It wasn't about uh, go USA, but it was more about. Just remember that we have um, some soldiers and some families that have dedicated them, like, their, themselves to defend us. So they get it in France. Wow, we love it. Great. You know, let's put it as our, our opening short before the feature. Then they send it to jury and stuff, and they call us back. It's too political. Sorry, you're not in the festival. But by this time, we already bought our tickets and our flights, oh. hotel, press release. So now we're getting into politics, like global politics. So we're fighting back, no, no, we need to go, we need to go, no, we can't do this to us. So they said, okay, well, we already gave up all the slots, but if you want, you know, we have this, we digitize all the films, and we have this thing called Short Film Corner, which is like 2,000 films that they digitize. They have booths all over town, and people can come and watch them and stuff. So we just took the offer, like, okay, we'll just go to Short Film Corner, because we we're in the festival, let's go. It's a private situation. So here we are in France doing our thing, promoting the film, watch it, digitize, whatever. So, you know, red carpet um, for other films, and we had a we had blast, but, you know, we didn't get our screening on the big screen. Well, what they did, though, is there was a competition among the short films. So, we said our goodbyes, we were there for the first seven or eight of 11 days or something. We left early. We're on the flight, and we get a text message, congratulations, the number one viewed film in the whole film festival. Right? <laughs> so, we're like, okay, what does that mean, right? Well, we're going to show the film before the closing night film. We're in Amsterdam, party. <laughs> <laughs> now we had a real reason to party. So, wow, great high five. We land in LA, congratulations, standing ovation. It, wasn't our, it was our world premiere, and we weren't even there. Oh, <laughs> no. But it's about the art. Yeah. Yeah. It really is. It really, at that point, we were just like, you know what? We did an amazing job, and that's what it was, it's about. They enjoyed it, and then screened in L.A. and all this stuff. Well, where is that film out today? Well, now we have an investment firm that has committed to raise $200 million with the company. Based on that film and a couple of other films, uh, like Les, Les Miserables, the play, uh, my, my business partner, he's going to be the direct, directing uh, a new feature on that one and other projects and stuff. So, you know, it's a beautiful story of, of us uh, not being in our world premiere, but it's also created a momentum for us, which is what short films are supposed to be. And um, Joseph, I'm actually going to throw you a little off because I actually have a question for you that's not on the list. Um, oh, well, good. Then maybe I'll have an answer to this one. <laughs> <laughs>
not about policies, it's not about procedures, it's about doing whatever we need to do to get the best product at the end of the day. And it creates a tension uh, for, you know, for, for the business side, and I'm clearly more on the business side, and they're clearly more on the show side, uh, which is much more entertaining. Uh, but, uh, but it does create that tension. It creates that tension where you know, you're trying to deal with the business side and the legal potential issues that come up, and you've got you know, an environment, a culture, where the idea is you do what you need to do to get the product that, that, that's going to be the most entertaining. And, you know, it's not just an entertainment. It can be in a lot of different businesses. But I find that entertainment tends to be more tolerant of um, difficult and people and bad behavior <laughs> than any other business I work with. Uh, they, you know, they'll let somebody go for a long time if they're, if, you know, if they're a big star or they bring dollars in.
advertiser views the theater audience as a captive audience. You're already yes. there. You gave your you're money. Interested. You're sitting there. They don't have to spend a lot of money to yeah. get your attention. Your eyes are on the screen because that's the only place they can be. So you're, there's no reason to spend more money to get your attention. We're just going to pour this gold and pop them over you whether you like it or not. Exactly. Right. And you know the, all the uh, like slide shows? <coughs>
more geared for the older audience. Um, however, because a friend of mine runs that, and uh, a movie I was just working on, I really wanted them to run it, but they're also looking for the bigger films, the bigger exposure. Now, they're not going to go to Spider-Man, but they would go to um, a lot of Slumdog. Yeah. Oh, that's such an odd mm -hmm. thing. There are also a lot of the chains and are, are looking at programming theaters through the day. If you notice now, you can't go to a movie before like 117 and 130, which I don't understand, especially in Hollywood, because if you're not on a movie, um, you, you might have time. So many people are uh, don't work in an office, so to speak, that if you want to see a movie and maybe you want to go at 10 in the morning, 11 in the morning, you can't. I think it's so insane, but in any event, it, and it's you know on every couple of hours. Um, so there are a number of chains that have like the mommy and me mornings, so moms can bring kids, and everybody in that room knows that they're going to hear screaming children at a, at a you know like a Disney film or a G-rated film. Um, Paranormal, which is getting this uh, you know a lot of hype about what a brilliant campaign it, it, that campaign of opening at midnight has been around for very long. Um, and I'm just thrilled that Paramount actually let them do it. I keep coming up with that idea because when I get, always get shot down. But um, having something unique, you know, maybe for the 20, 30 somethings that want to want to get out of the house to go to a scary movie at midnight. Um, I think it's uh, Regal has a deal that uh, I, don't know, I, I think four or five hundred of their screens show the New York Met on a Sunday afternoon. So there's a lot of thought going into uh, the, the theater experience. So I do think you are going to see a lot of change with that. And maybe during the week, <laughs> get some <laughs> adults there. Uh, so, <laughs> big problems <laughs> just, just call for big solutions. And, and uh, it's an opportunity to reinvent the industry and to reinvent the, the means of distribution. So the 
theater is going through a change, and the hope of the theater is in regional theater. There's a lot of wonderful theater that's done in this country every day of the week. It's not necessarily done in New York, it's done in Los Angeles, in Chicago, 